are live. Welcome everyone to today's parlor, or tonight's parlor rather. I am joined by my co-host Andrew Stratelites, and we are discussing virtue ethics. So Andrew, um, do we have a, uh, let's see here. I, I, I invited you to this kind of off the cuff, and this was this whole thing was very, very ad-libbed, very um very sort of spur of the moment. Uh, and I because my ordinary co-host is currently doing some gaming streaming that is taking up a lot of her time, and I wanted to do something more philosophical, and you're one of my tweets, I think that's the hip word for, for a Twitter mutual, who discusses a lot of this stuff. Um, would you mind introducing yourself so some of the viewers can maybe get to know you? Sure. Um, um, I'm mostly on Twitter nowadays. I was a part of the Escaping Atheism Project, um, which engaged in sort of online street apologetics. Uh, I have a background in a Stoic philosophy. Uh, professionally, I work in computing and engineering. Uh, I'm an Anglican Christian. Um, I'm a subdeacon, which which means that I, I help with the liturgical service um, and uh, do lots of stuff uh, looking at society and self improvement and religion and uh, even engineering through sort of the philosophical lens. Uh, and so that's sort of my thing. Right. Okay. So um, we've so you and I uh, have a pretty similar backgrounds in a lot of ways, right? Both of us are tech professionals. We're both engineers, specifically in the in the computing space. Both of us are virtue ethicists. Both of us are religious. You know, we we uh, we vibe pretty well on this multiple fronts. So to uh, to get started. The first thing I wanted to do was, for our viewers, summarize a little bit of the history of virtue ethics, and especially its history over the past 400 years or so, and then kind of bring that up to the present day so that we can start our discussion. So if you go back... Uh, sure. Hmm? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So if you go back to ancient Greece, or if you go back to ancient Rome, you find that... Virtue ethics predominates what we today would call virtue ethics predominates because at that point what was centered in the study of ethics was moral qualities moral character uh, Morality understood as or ethics understood primarily in terms of How it proceeds from and affects the person who practices ethics uh, So for example Rather than asking what are the consequences of this and does it maximize utility, like a consequentialist would say, or does this accord with a moral rule, as a deontologist would say, a virtue ethicist will say, what personal qualities does this exemplify? And there is this sort of downstream question that is implicit in that, which is what moral qualities will I gain as a result of doing this? Will this make me better or worse? And maybe that's not directly stated, but it's implicitly a part of virtue ethics. Now, virtue ethics was the dominant form of, of Western ethical thinking during ancient times, during classical antiquity and so on. And it continued that dominance through the Christian era up until the Enlightenment. During the Enlightenment, things broke apart and we wound up with utilitarianism, or excuse me, consequentialism and deont uh, what is it? Deont deontology? Deontology, yes. And deontology is a school of ethical thinking that asks, is this right or wrong? Does it accord with a moral rule? And consequentialism asks, what are the consequences of this action? Whereas Virtue ethics steadily retreated until it was almost completely eclipsed in the 19th century and then experienced a resurgence in Anglophone philosophy during the late 1950s. So for a brief moment, 400 years after the Enlightenment, it's sort of the 
high noon of modernity in the, in the 19th century, before stuff started to get postmodern, virtue ethics kind of winked out of existence, and now it's back, even after it was dominant for thousands of years. Um, and I, I think this is interesting because it seems to be a return to classical ethics. Rather than considering things in terms of an abstract system, although abstract systems may play a part, we consider things in terms of what kind of personal qualities engender our actions and what effect our actions will have on our own selves. And this is especially, I think, evident in the resurgence of interest in schools of thought like Stoicism, traditional Christian ethics, even among people who are not religious, and uh, Buddhism, for that matter. So anything to that, Andrew? Yeah, I, I guess the, the other thing I would say is that um, as philosophy went, sort of did ethics, right? Because especially the Stoic school, but uh, also Aristotelianism to a lesser extent and Platonism to an even lesser extent, was sort of aimed at practical um, advice, right? And that sort of tied in with this understanding of virtue ethics. And as philosophy sort of uh, switched to focusing on systems in some sense, or on um, even to the point of sophistical questions, uh, you sort of saw things sort of dampen with uh, the emphasis on virtue ethics. All right, and it's been tweeted out finally if you want to retweet or if anybody watching wants to retweet. Uh, and I think that you, you, you hit the nail on the head when you say that it primarily comes to practical advice in a lot of the ancient schools. Because the idea, this whole idea of like conceptual analysis, of analyzing a concept for the sake of analyzing a concept, is very much a consequence of enlightenment of the Enlightenment, of Enlightenment-era thinking. The idea of examining a concept in itself, that kind of conceptual analysis for its own sake, is very much a new sort of a thing, right? Because primarily, um, primarily, ethics was a practical field. The, 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 the driving question was not what is right and what is wrong, what are they as concepts in themselves, the, the question at that point in time was more along the lines of what is the good life and how do I get it? Because that was a real question for people back then. Once you got your head above water materially, and contrary to common belief, that didn't mean being filthy rich. There were plenty of lazy upper middle class people in advanced middle age who basically didn't have to do anything. That kind of exists in every society that I'm aware of, besides, you know, hunter-gatherers and such. Um, once you get your head above the water in terms of bare material necessity, the question of ultimate ends is going to rear its head. So how do you deal with it? Well, philosophy is the answer to that, or was the answer to that in the ancient world. So the idea was, what is the good life and how do I get it? And notice that first part, because originally it's, how do I live the good life? I want the good life. And of course, what is the Socratic rejoinder to that going to be? Typically, it's, uh, you have to know yourself, right? And right. You, you have to actually be good to lead a good life. Um, right. And, and yeah, this is sort of the fundamental thing, right? And, and the, the Stoics are pretty radical about it, right? That... Their point is moral development is actually necessary even at the point of survival, right? And that uh, only someone who has been mor morally developed to the point of perfection can actually be satisfied or rich, even if all he has is a penny, right? And and they, they have these paradoxes. And basically the, the key thing and, and you see it even in like early American history is this emphasis on the moral development as 
the necessary and sufficient condition for human flourishing. Um, now, the, the Christian critique of this is you can't do this on your own, right? You can't bootstrap this as a human. You have to rely on God. Um, but, but I don't think the Stoics especially were contrary to that, especially if you look at Seneca, who, who literally has a letter talking about how no man can be good except through, through God. Um, and yeah, I think that's sort of the key thing. And the shocking thing is in modern and contemporary philosophy, right? You can get a PhD in philosophy and never even learn about virtue ethics. Uh, William Irvine, who wrote a popular book on stoicism, only discovered stoicism after he was a professor. Oh, he started off um, studying Husserl in his early yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah, and doing exactly. phenomenology, and he got so fed up with the theoretical stuff, he said, screw it, I'm going to do virtue ethics. He actually teaches at a university not far from here, uh, Wright State. It's pretty close. I went there at one point with the intention of, of, of meeting him, but he was out of his office. <laughs> nice. But yeah, you, I mean, you're right. He, because... And this is something that, that I think is kind of interesting to touch on is the professionalization of contemporary philosophy, Be, because I, I would locate the reasons for that in the Enlightenment again. Now, I have a tendency to blame all bad things on the Enlightenment, as anybody who watches this channel can probably tell you, but I, I do think that this idea that everything has to work the way natural science does is a consequence of Enlightenment thinking. Because once you dethrone rationality of the ancient variety, you are left with nothing but instrumental rationality. Now, th there's a weird switch that happens in Enlightenment thinking, and I think it is relevant to this discussion because the Enlightenment is when virtue ethics falls off the top, right? There is a switch that happens in Enlightenment thinking. And it works like this. The ancient model of rationality is one where there's an objective, morally loaded order to the universe, and then a subjective faculty of reason by which we can perceive this ordering of the universe and live according to it. And this objective faculty of reason in the ancient model emerges as the means by which we live according to the the just order of the universe the objectively or well objective is kind of uh, maybe might be the wrong word the what is in fact the better way to live that there really is such a thing and it is does not it is not something that we construct well the enlightenment starts off with let's be as reasonable as possible and it seems to me that enlightenment thinking kind of begins as an attempt to once and for all settle this and once and for all nail down what this objective ordering of the universe is. That's why early enlightenment, early modern philosophy is largely a history of medical, metaphysical systems that all claim to be the last word. Uh, Spinoza does that, Descartes does that, Leibniz does that, and all three of those are theists, although Spinoza is debatable. Um, but what happens in Enlightenment thinking is that when we realize, oh, hey, we can't agree on anything here, it kind of falls apart and the Enlightenment emphasis on reason continues, but the ancient model of reasoning does not. Because with the idea of an objective moral ordering and an objective rational ordering falling away, what we are left with, essentially, is an... What we are left with is instrumental reasoning, what the Frankfurt School would have called instrumental rationality. This idea that things proceed whichever, whatever way they proceed, and rationality is just a way to get the results you want. So what happens is, is the Enlightenment emphasis on rationality remains. Yes, rationality is still the best thing ever, but for different reasons now. Not because it lets us live in accordance with the objective rational ordering of the cosmos, but because it lets us um but because it lets us get what we want essentially 
And so natural science is now the coolest thing ever, and everything must work like natural science. And one of the consequences of this over the past few centuries has been the steady professionalization of philosophy, especially English language philosophy is set up to work the way the sciences do. Because this idea is that, you know, since, since natural science is the bee's knees, that means that everything should work the way natural science does, and if it, the more like natural science it is, the more it's worth. Because natural science is like a gold standard for human cognition. Yeah, and the, the other thing, right, and, and this really bothers me as sort of a virtue eth uh, ethicist is it, it makes instrumental rationality doesn't tell you what goals to pick in the first place, right? It just says, given that this is your goal, uh, this is the approach you should use for it, right? And um, the hard problem in ethics and in sort of personal moral development is literally having the right goals, right? And this sort of implicit, it, it, and you know, it varies, but there's this sort of implicit um, subjectivity or arbitrariness of what your morality is, right? And even if you look at more, um, more theistic or more ordered uh, enlightenment thinkers like Kant, the issue is they don't have a limiting factor, right? They don't talk about how how there's an alignment. Everything is just a mental model and therefore can be arbitrarily made or unmade. And and this is sort of the the the, the key thing, right? Is that with enlightenment thinking, you can get someone like Edmund Burke, right, who is really sympathetic to virtue ethics and classical thought, but there's no limit, there's no boundary to prevent Edmund Rousseau uh, or, or, or basically a postmodernist a few generations later. Right, right. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, if I, I can take a car, to, to use an analogy, I can take a car and stack up as much horsepower as I want on my car. I can make my car's engine as big and strong and powerful as possible. And I can make it go as fast as I want and increase the acceleration and so on. None of that tells me where I'm going to go in it. And what we have right now is this really bizarre aimlessness as a civilization, because we've embraced the idea that the whole point is to make the car as big and fast as possible. And when, it, when the question arises, well, where do we go with it? The, the, the best answer we can come up with is wherever we can get more stuff to make it bigger and go faster. W which yeah. isn't really an answer. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and part of it is, do, by doing this, we're sort of shirking the responsibility, uh, both in the academy and the culture at large, of maintaining and cultivating virtue, right? And that, and you know, the the, the Stoics are radical, but but I think it's even true if you use a less radical view that if you have a populace that is virtuous, right? A lot of problems of governance and politics just literally go away. Um, the, the question, of course, is how do you maintain and cultivate that, right? Right. Right, precisely. And, and the answer, I think the reason that's such a hard question for us postmoderns to answer is because there's no state solution. The state can't do it. It's not something you do with the state. And when, when you say that to someone, like, there's no policy solution, very often the response you get is, well, then what do you want to do? You know, people, it frustrates people because they ask, we're, we're so accustomed to thinking in terms of, in terms of state solutions and in terms of policy that the idea that you could do anything else, that there's literally any other way of thinking about solving problems is, is just lost on us. We only think in terms of state policy. Like the fact that maybe, I don't know, we could get things done by organizing or by 
writing and speaking or that it starts with you, the individual, that's lost on people. Or maybe not completely lost because people do have an idea of activism. But notice that contemporary activism always culminates in an alteration or replacement of, in the case of revolution, of the state. There is almost never an idea that you can change things without the end goal be having to involve the state somehow. Yeah, or yeah, or the de de destruction, right? Like the common trope, especially in, in protest movements, is if we eliminate the bad thing, then the good thing will that has been suppressed will just self-organize magically without effort, right? And um, a lot of human civilization and culture and even self-development is more like trying to make a permaculture garden, right? That there's a lot of hard effort uh, that isn't mechanistic, but is organic, right? That you have to weed, uh, you, you have to, you know, water the good plants and weed the bad ones and, and engage in each one sort of in this hands-on specific way to it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I think that your what you say about this assumption that good things will naturally arise when we suppress the bad things is very characteristic of contemporary libertarian movements. There's this idea that everything will just self-organize in an emergent, bottom-up, lovely, democratic, uh, classically liberal fashion as long as we get the state out of the way. And there is some truth to that, at least as far as economics is concerned because a capitalism does become more efficient in the absence of state control. That doesn't necessarily make it better because it also becomes much more brutal in that context. Um, but, but that is sort of the eternal curse of libertarians that they only think in terms of economics. And yeah, definitely. And, and basically part of it too is what function do you want the economy to serve, right? Like if we if we had a virtuous populace that had perfectly moral goals, then a efficient economy would be ideal because everyone would have the right goals, right, of of moral development and closeness to God and loving their neighbor. But the issue we have to deal with is people having the wrong goals, right? And if you have the wrong goals, you actually want to be inefficient uh, in pursuing them. Well, I mean, for example, if your goal is to make as much money as possible and the government puts a price on rats because they want to rid the city of rats, you might start farming rats and bringing in the tails. Look how many I killed. I got 10 more breeding at home, you know? That actually happened in a city in Vietnam under French occupation, by the way. Um, yeah, the Cobra effect is hilarious, right? These unintended consequences of trying to incentivize behavior. <laughs> and, and, and we run into it the same thing when you're trying to cultivate virtue, right? Because and the virtual signaling is the problem, right? That you can claim to be virtuous without being really virtuous, right? Or you can engage in these external actions, but since they're done to try to, to gain something outside of it instead of intrinsically, they're, they're not really cultivating virtue as efficiently as, as doing them for their own sake would be. Right, and, and that's another thing is that if in terms of cultivating virtue, again, there's no state solution. You don't cultivate virtue through a system of incentives and disincentives. That just doesn't work. The only way to cultivate virtue genuinely is to be virtuous, and it'll spread. And, if, and this is where people will sort of angrily demand, like, so what's your proposal? And they want to hear a policy solution. Well, there's no policy solution. The, the solution is start being virtuous. And, and people act as if that's a cop-out or as if it's a non-solution. No, it's the only workable solution. Yeah, well, the, the analogy I use is it's like people are like, okay, what drug do I need to take to become muscular and stronger? And like, even if you take steroids, uh, you, if you're not stimulating your muscles, you're not going to get stronger. So the answer is you got to lift weights if you want to get better at lifting weights, right? And to and the same thing with the virtue, right? If you want to cultivate this, you got to practice it. 
And, uh, and I mean, part of it is we're sort of steeped in this classical and Christian view, right, of, of virtue involves like prayerful reflection and monitoring yourself and, and confessing your sins and all, and all these other things. Um, and th that's, I guess, the other thing too, is that the correct general advice is so broad that people think it's an, uh, that they think it's a you know a empty say right because I can if we you know spend a few hours talking about all the all the things in your life we could come up with a list of things you could do to increase your virtue but for me to do that to the arbitrary audience member um, it's it's going to come off as a platitude right right it's going to come off as a platitude because this stuff this cultivation of virtue can only happen in personal relationships, right? It has to be someone you're close to, but can it happen on a wider scale, and if so, how? And the only thing that I can think of are politicians and, using the word in a very, very broad sense, celebrities. People imitate thinkers they admire. People imitate Nietzsche. People imitate Camus. People imitate Sartre. Some people, if they're nerdy enough, will imitate Wittgenstein. But in all of those cases, notice that there is a social, or I almost want to say a parasocial relationship between the people who are cultivating virtue and the people who are sort of displaying it or broadcasting it. Because it seems to me that... For whatever reason, the idea of doing things through a concrete social relation is just lost on a lot of moderns. There always has to be a policy or a, some technological solution or some fucking button you can push, you know what I mean? Th this idea that you have to, there exists a relationship between you and another human being, a concrete relationship, a concrete living relationship that must be acted upon and must be, you know, must undergo change as you change. This is something that is almost foreign to people, which is shocking. It is shocking that something like that could be lost on people, because if you think about it, it really should be the most natural thing. I mean, maybe it's a case of the fish not knowing what water is, but I really think that we've actually lost something very basic, especially over the past few decades. Yeah, I would agree, right? And it's it's almost like the systemization of education, right? That that uh, people think that if you have the curriculum and the program, it doesn't matter the, the 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 like personal qualities, right? It's not seen as sort of like ninja turtles or things like this right where there's a master and the students are formed by the master both their personality and this tradition that's flowing through them right and and that that outside of like our our pop culture uh, understanding of martial arts it seems to be lost that that's how these skills get transferred from one person to another Right. And, and, and what's weird is that that's a very natural way to transfer things. There's an episode of, uh, to, to throw some pop culture in, there's an episode of Seinfeld, right, where George has a man crush on another character. And they're sitting across from each other on the table, and George is wearing his, his baseball cap with the brim facing forward, and the other guy is wearing his backward. George is obviously very excited to be talking to this guy, and he halfway through turns his cap around backwards to resemble him. And it's really obvious that that's why he's doing it, and it's hilarious. Um, but why is that? Yeah, fun? exactly. But why is that funny? Be because it's a very, very basic aspect of humans. And I, I think that especially in liberal societies, post 20th century, we have this idea that you should never, 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 never imitate anyone else or look up to anyone else because equality, essentially. Um, or because house cat, as the case may be, uh, but 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 ultimately, I don't think that that's really workable because I think it flies directly in the face of a lot of natural human tendencies. 
Of course, the people who, who advocate this kind of thinking don't believe in natural human tendencies because human nature is a pre-modern notion or whatever. Uh, but, but the fact remains that whether you believe in an abstract or ideal human nature or not, regardless of whether you think that's a real thing, um, the fact remains that people imitate each other. They especially imitate people they look up to. You know, Bill Gates is known for doing this, this, this sort of uh, vaguely autistic rocking motion. And apparently, I, I've been told or I've read accounts of this that if you go to a Microsoft board meeting, there's all these people sitting around the table and they're all doing – all these executives doing this and it looks like a meeting of ecstatic rabbis or something. Uh, and that's a – and that's just another case of this. So what really needs to happen, I think, is that people need to, if they feel that they are cultivating virtue at all, by the time you hit 30 or so, you should have a few protégés, you know? And this shouldn't be thought of as like a social media influencer thing. You should just have a few. Even if it's your younger relatives, there ought to be people looking up to you. And if there aren't, you should ask yourself why that is, you know? And if, if there are some people looking up to you, then you should be trying to help them out and and push them to cultivate virtue. Now this all sounds, this is all right on the edge of sounding platitudinous, so I'm going to give it a little bit more teeth and say that this requires some, some variety of systematic understanding of what virtue is. Yeah, definitely, right? And the other thing this, this actually takes advantage of is, um, uh, is they did a study, right, on different types of learning uh, of like humans and chimpanzees and orangutans and, and stuff like that. And basically what they found is like the type of learning that you engage in where it's directly with the environment, uh, those primates are as good as humans, right? The thing that they lack is the ability to engage in with social learning or mimicking something. You can give a, a human a, an example of someone else doing an activity, and thereafter, a few times, they'll be able to mimic it, mimic it exactly. And then the other fascinating thing is we don't actually need, to, it helps to know, right? But we don't actually need to know the reason for the behaviors for us to mimic them. Um, and this comes into the social learning thing, right? Is that if we purposely in our lives mimic examples of virtue in our day-to-day -day life or or parasocially you know in old books um, this is a really effective way to do it that that is in accord with our human nature right yeah yeah it is and that that's the thing that really that really hits home is that there's nothing weird or strange or wrong about this the only ideology i think unfortunately it is the dominant one at the present time that would reject this line of reasoning is liberalism, which is the natural outcome of modernism. This idea that there should be people you look up to, they are in some sense higher up than you are in a qualitative hierarchy, that you should imitate them, that you should in some sense assume they're correct by default. That doesn't mean you never question them, but it does mean that you start from the assumption that they're probably right, and if they seem like they're not right, maybe you just don't understand why yet. And this is all stuff that tends to arrange people in hierarchies, which is necessary for any degree of social cohesion that is not uh, maintained by institutions. Although we're, we're far enough along in modernity now that that very idea seems absurd to a lot of people, it, doesn't it? The, the idea of, of a social ordering or of a social group or of some variety of relations between people that are not dictated by institutions, particularly those of the state or corporations, is, 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 is very foreign to a lot of modern people, I feel. Definitely, right? And, um, yeah, and it's sort of like that the institution is, isn't it, we used to have lots of things like um, fraternal organizations and and churches and all these things which uh, did this too. And it's really weird that that sort of third place has disappeared. Yeah. 
Although it, it's weird, but I think it's also predictable, right? Because because modernity, especially in, you know, modernity, liberalism, capitalism, these are all just different facets of the form of society that emerged after the Enlightenment. Capitalism is the economic side of it, and liberalism is sort of the social and political side of it. But, but all of these, what it all comes down to is, I think, two sides of a coin, is that, and that is, and that's equality and individualism. Everything is separate from everything else until otherwise noted, and everything is the same as everything else, except in some purely quantitative sense. Um, and it makes sense if you think about it, because modern natural science cannot understand anything unless it can be broken down into identical units that can be counted, right? It can't understand anything that unless it can be broken down into identical units that can be counted. And of course, the social sciences don't do that, but those aren't really science. Uh, capitalism doesn't understand anything besides the movement of capital. And what is capital besides identical units of value that can be counted? Because capitalism, uh, as the Dark Enlightenment philosopher Nick Land observed, is an AI, essentially. Or it incarnates intelligence in a manner similar to an AI. And for that matter, a computer needs everything to be identical units that can be counted, and we call this data, zeros and ones. It's either on or it's off. So, and, and liberalism, you know, every citizen is equal to every other because equality, teardrop. And we, and we can be counted, and the counting is democracy. So identical units that can be counted is sort of the essence of all, of all modernity. And the reason that all of those older forms of fraternal organizations and churches and so on break down, I feel, is because modernity breaks them down because they get in the way of, of everything being an identical unit that can be counted. If, a, if, a, if in a guild a master uh, smith is qualitatively different from a beginner, from an apprentice, from a journeyman, then... that gets in the way of everything being an identical countable unit. We need to outsource this to some kind of institution that people start on one side as nothing, and on the other side they come out as having this qualification that makes lets them do this kind of work. And that way you can set it up almost like a function that you can do math with. Again, identical units can be counted. Yeah, and... Um... Yeah, it's basically sort of this dysfunction of... I'll call it civilization, right? That part of the, part of it is to get through our day in as city dwellers. We can't encounter everyone as the complex image of God that they are, right? And we gotta be able to put a persona on them and like be like, oh, you know, you are you are the guy that gets me coffee, or you're a woman who is a pedestrian. And I don't hit the pedestrians when I'm in my car because I'm busy, you know, and so on and so forth, right? But the issue is that that used to be or needs to be sort of a practical layer that is turned on when only necessary, right? And that most of our engagement should be on this personal level. And for, you know, even 20 years ago, you're exactly right. We had more of this in society, at least based on the, the statistics, like something like 20 or 30% of men of a certain age and younger don't have anyone they consider a friend, right? And like women, it's like five to 10%. And if all of your social interactions are mediated through institutions, right? and secular institutions that that's going to be pretty bad right like uh and yeah that 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 i think is sort of the the what we're running into is not engaging with the sort of complexity of this right and i think you hit the nail on the head when you say that all of our social engagement is mediated by institutions when it should be on this more personal level, even though it almost never is. Um, 
And I think that there is an emergent behavior in the system here where any personal relationship that is not mediated by institutions will be rationalized away in one way or another. And the most common way of doing that, I think, will be to say, oh, this is biased or this is bigoted on some level because it's not uh, mathematically equal to everything else. You know, if you have a loyalty to your own children that you do not have to strangers, then that's some variety of bigotry or prejudice or what have you because it's not equal. Because a real egalitarian would just call everybody comrade. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, part of this is right. The, the, the fundamental conflict that we're running into is one of the things that comes out of the Enlightenment, right? And there's no strong boundary between it and other parts of the Enlightenment is this sort of like radical, uh, radical deconstruction or sort of Marx, Marxist spirit, right? That uh, everyone will be comrade, all of these things that differentiate us until, uh, you know, utopia comes are, are bad. And the, the fascinating thing to me is how much sway those people seem to have, at least on parts of the discourse, right? And I'm I'm sort of an internet weirdo, right? But even even the the fact that it's in the the internet weirdos is sort of disconcerting, right? And uh, the other thing that that I've noticed is the internet is leaking a lot more, right? Um, in the sense that you know I'll go to a coffee shop and I'll hear people talking and they'll be talking about things that come from my weird corner of Twitter. Right, and so these ideas are no longer sort of isolated into this internet subculture, but this is uh, flowing into the pop culture. Right, right. So when you say, what what did you say? I, I sort of didn't quite hear what you said about internet weirdos toward the beginning of your talk. Yeah, it, basically it's, uh, I mean, some of my exposure is biased because uh, of how I use Twitter, right? That I'm not getting like a statistically valid analysis of the average American. But even so, that sort of weird subset that I see, right? Because what Twitter does is um, it sort of amplifies the things that someone finds the most interesting in a broad sense, right? And interesting can mean like horrifying reaction to it, or it can mean this is really cool. It right? amplifies anything that gets a strong emotional reaction, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And the, so, I mean, part, part of it might be that, right? But, but I will hear radical things in person that come from the internet, right? And there's sort of a... Um, uh, an open boundary, right? Like the internet is in some sense more like television used to be, even though it's not so fully centralized. Right. Let me see here. Am I... I just, uh, I don't know if I've seen silence do good around here lately, or if I've seen him before. Um, anyway, but you're right, the internet is leaking more, and I remember when I was younger, and I was walking around with my friends. We were all kind of early adopters of a lot of internet technologies. I'll just come clean. I was a 4chan kid. You know, between 13 and 19 or so, I was a B-tard, as they say. And so were all my friends. We were all 4chan kids, and we would rock around saying things like, oh, I did it for the rules, you know. And it was funny because we would go around sharing these memes and it was like a big inside joke that only we got because who says internet stuff in real life? Well, now, I mean, geez, everybody says internet stuff in real life. The internet's part of real life now because so many more people do it. And incidentally, a lot of people, more people behave like stereotypical internet nerds of yesteryear. A lot more people are lonely and don't have a lot of friends and are sexually deviant or dysfunctional and are 
are sort of isolated and full of anxiety and depression and so on. And I think that's because we got the causation wrong. It's not that people end up get on the internet because they are that way. They're that way from spending too much time on the internet. <laughs> but now we all do that, so we're all ba we're all turning into internet nerds essentially, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that it's uh, uh, a two, at least two parts of it, right? That they combine and reinforce each other, and. Um, you can see it with some some people that that uh, the, the most radical example is like some of these chronic diseases, right? Where these people self-diagnose, oftentimes a young woman with a chronic disease, and then they take away internet access to the the support community for it. And suddenly, uh, along with some other interventions, right? Usually, it's relatively straightforward, like talk therapy or, you know, going to a dietitian or something, uh, the chronic d disease disappears. Right, and in incidentally, I have a tendency to attract such people. You know, I, I had a, I, I think a lot of them called themselves spoonies. I believe we may have read the same article. I, I found it from Twitter, yes. so. Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. And this, it's it, it's almost as if the internet is a vector of mental illness in a lot of ways. It allows people to spread their ideas, and more than anything, what spreads through purely intellectual communication tends to be personal dysfunction. Uh, hmm, I'm not sure if that's that. That definitely is the biggest downside to it, right? Um. The the other thing, right, and part of it is probably a disconnect on what is best for us versus what's best for like Twitter as the company, is that we can use it the same way that we use old books or examples, right? So if we set up the incentives a little bit differently, so it wasn't what was provided the most emotion, right? But uh, but let's say the most a motion of like respect, respect and admiration that got retweeted, and I'm not sure exactly how we would set that up. But but if we did, then Twitter would be a very different place, right? And the internet would be in general. And and I think that part of this is in fact due to the way that social media works and sort of the dysfunctional incentives that it has. Um, uh, uh, of course, I, I think there's a tendency for it to naturally decay, right? Because you, well, uh, you end up with that on 4chan. But at the same time, you also end up with like 4chan book, book lists, which are like classical and excellent. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think that it, people have the wrong edge of the sword, so to speak, right? They're, they're holding the sword with the wrong edge. Um, uh, when it comes to internet stuff. Holding the sword with the wrong edge, how do you mean? I mean, instead of holding the handle, they're holding the blade. Oh, no, I get that, but in what sense are they doing that? Yeah, um, basically, uh, basically ending up with a feed full of things that are curated to cause the most outrage by, by your friends, right? So this is why I really dislike outrage quote Twitter, because basically what you're doing is you're selecting the absolute worst thing that you saw in your day and sharing it with your friends. And that is the the the, the, the type of thing that, that I'm talking about. And the, the cure other for thing this, that happens on Facebook is oh go ahead. The, and the cure for this is an awareness of how this stuff affects you, right? Like, well, what, what, what does the algorithm select for? Well, it selects for, it, it selects for whatever is most emotionally impactful. Well, what might that be? Uh, usually something negative. So maybe yes. we should have a think about this, right? Maybe we should have a care and say, hey, just because, and I have found myself doing this on Twitter repeatedly. Every time I see something and I'm tempted to get in a fight with someone, I go, nope, 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 nope. I mean, there was a one point at which uh, I saw someone 
being extremely passive aggressive to somebody whom I respected and I jumped in and uh, said some fairly nasty things. I think I told him to shove a telephone pole up his ass so he could be a passive aggressive piece of shit 30 feet in the air. The guy ended up deleting all his messages. I was kind of brutal. And as funny as that is, it's not the right thing to do, right? Because there's already enough negativity there. But this isn't just some platitude and this, like, be positive thing. It's the fact that this negativity, the, the stuff that gets a negative emotional reaction, has a tendency to propagate. And it will continue to propagate using you as a vector unless you consciously veto it. But in order to do that, you have to be aware of sort of its insidious mechanism of action. Yeah, definitely. And, and then a layer on top of that is the algorithm literally looks at any engagement and it can't tell the difference between positive and negative. And so if you like the tweet and if you're having a really interesting discussion that goes a hundred like replies or you're having like a flame war that's going a hundred, the algorithm doesn't make, know the difference. And in some sense, you're feeding the algorithm. I like this even if it's not that you like it, it's that, you know, you're infuriated by it. Thanks, and, I hate and, it. it. Yeah. And, and I mean, this, this is actually a virtue, right? Uh, clear judgment is a virtue, right? And, and purposely trying to curate your followers' feeds of things that are beneficial, right? Because occasionally correcting an error is beneficial or pointing out um, something that's dangerous or someone who is dangerous can be beneficial. But aiming for other people's benefit and sort of loving them in that abs abstract way is a really good strategy too. Yes. And, um, and well, let me tell you a story. When I was about 12, I went to a Renaissance fair with my family. And one of the shows was a show that involved two men fighting with swords and doing tricks. Like, fight with their swords and they throw their swords at each other at the same time and they both catch them at the same time. That kind of thing. You know, acrobatics and stuff. And But this show had a comedic uh, component, as Renaissance fair performances tend to have. And the comedic component was this. Whenever we do something really cool, boo. Whenever we do something really cool, we want you to boo. Because if you cheer, nobody cares. But if everybody boos, everyone walking by will stop and look. Yes, exactly. Because negativity is much more impactful in most cases than positivity. And there are places in where they've ha figured this out and had it figured out for decades. One of my friends once expressed bemusement at the fact that newspapers in East Asia, such as Japanese newspapers, will publish articles that say things like, oh, elementary school students plant beautiful garden. You know, why would you print something like that? Well, better question, why wouldn't you? Because newspaper articles are always going to tend toward the negative. Because what? how do media companies make money? They make it through engagement. How do they get engagement? Usually by saying horrible shit. So whenever you see fear-mongering and so on in the media, it's not so much that they're conspiring to make everyone miserable. It's a case of emergent behavior. They have an incentive to create negative emotions in the populace. So they're going to continue to do that. Yeah, exactly. And, and part of it is there's a cultural lock-on effect, probably, right? That since the norm in East Asia is to do those types of, uh, of uh, things, that's what's expected, and there's a lot of like cultural momentum behind it, right? And in the West or in America specifically, we sort of have the opposite. To do what sorts of things? Uh, to, to, you know, uh, basically emphasize the negativity or the possible calamity, right? Uh, as opposed to sort of the East Asian paper where it's saying something positive or, or of, of the, that, that is pleasant emotions. And, and I mean, part of it too is we live in such a deeply civilized culture that we don't get a lot of variability in our day-to-day -day life. 
things, right? And part of it is, as humans, we need variability. And uh, uh, sometimes we get them in really bad ways, like with the news or, or risking our health or things like that. Uh, as opposed to sort of healthier ways like sports. Right. Because our quest for novelty will lead us to seek out things that make us feel something. And why do people watch horror movies? Why do people watch something like Game of Thrones, which is basically George R. R. Martin spanking his reader, right? Why do people do that? Well, because they want to feel something. And if it, as long as it makes you feel something, it's a, it's a reprieve from the monotony of the day-to-day. Now, to tie all this back into virtue ethics, I think that cultivating virtue, in this case, the, the virtue that has to be cultivated, well, I, I'm not sure. Maybe you'll have something to say about this. Is there a virtue that can be cultivated that counters this sort of thing? And if so, what virtue would it be? I'd, I'd say it's temperance, right? Uh, temperance is the virtue of holding yourself back from going towards things that you naively think are what you want. Um, and the reason why it's associated with the word temper or tempered, right, is that it's about, in some sense, bridling your negative emotions, or at least the negative emotions that drive you to do things. Right, and in in uh, in traditional Christian ethics, there are seven capital sins and opposite corresponding capital virtues. So, for example, we have the the sin of gluttony, and the virtue like pride is a capital sin, and what counters it is humility. Greed is a capital sin; what counters it is generosity. You counter the greed in yourself by being generous to extinguish your greed. And if someone is greedy, you could even be generous to them to give them an example that could extinguish their greed. The opposite of anger is patience. Um, and that is something that can make you less angry, but if you practice patience with an angry person, it can also make them less angry. So another one is, is um, gluttony. And gluttony understood more abstractly is not always about eating food. It can just it, it can mean something closer to greed. Although not exactly the same thing. Whereas it, it, gluttony in the sense is more immediate than greed. Greed wants to hoard things, gluttony wants to consume things. And the opposite of gluttony is temperance. So in a, in a way, I think it's easy to be a glutton in our in our uh, present situation because there's so much to consume. Yeah, definitely, right, and and that that's what we're talking about. And uh, in some sense, gluttony is about consuming based on your appetite, right, as opposed to based on what is best for you. And, and that's why fasting is actually the, the typical um, counter to it, right? And maybe that, that's the answer, that, you know, one day a week of internet use or social media use might be beneficial, but seven days a week isn't. All right. Okay, so, um, so, it, so I think it's sort of the conclusion of our talk here is, one, ought to, be, ought to cultivate temperance and help to cultivate it in other people. As a closing remark, could you maybe say how a person would do that? You say fasting, is there another way or are there other kinds of fasting? Yeah, so uh, if, you're, if you're focused on building temperance, which is also called self-control, um, typically the, the way that I suggest is at the end of the day, either mentally or in a, in a book, like a journal, rate yourself out of five stars of how self-controlled you have been. And the things that help are actually doing things physically that uh, have some difficulty. So cold showers help, uh, fasting helps, um, handling sleep deprivation can help. 
basically anything where you have a sort of base desire for something and you withhold it. And even just um, practicing uh, delaying it helps, right? Like in, instead of eating when you're hungry, you're going to wait 10 minutes and see if you're still hungry. Right, and same type of thing with Twitter or, or or whatever thing you want to have in control. Yes, yes, I would agree, and also uh, anything that has a good result further down the line in ten sort of longer time preference is also probably good. So lifting weights. Uh, so thank you everyone for showing up. I really appreciate all the user engagement here and all of my audience showing up and all my friends. It's always nice to see you all here. Uh, I would say that that is all we have for now.